welcome to this podcast of the Florida Historical Quarterly. My name is Daniel Murphy, and I am assistant editor of the journal. If you are new to these podcasts, please visit the Florida Historical Quarterly on Facebook, where you can now access abstracts of each article and the current issue of the journal. Today's podcast features an interview with Derek R. Everett, a faculty member at the Metropolitan State University of Denver and Colorado State University. In the interview, Dr. Everett and I discuss his article titled, The Mouse and the State House, Intersections of Florida's Capitals and Walt Disney World, that was published in the summer 2017 issue of the FHQ. Please introduce yourself to our audience and tell us a little bit about your academic background. Well, my name is Derek Everett, and I'm a member of the history department at two universities in Colorado, uh, Metropolitan State University of Denver, which is in downtown Denver, and Colorado State University in Fort Collins. And it might seem a little odd you know, to your listeners wondering why some upstart punk from one of those giant rectangles out in the West is, is talking about our capital. I mean, how, how, how rude. <laughs> the, my, my interest in state capitals goes back about two decades when I started as a tour guide and a researcher at the Colorado State Capitol. And I've published a book and several articles, and I do presentations on the Capitol, and I still give tours and do research uh, when I can at the State House here in Denver. And the interest in the Capitol there has continued through my career. I've done a number of different projects, mostly on American West or on Colorado history, but state capitals are a, a constant theme from which I can never escape. I, I think the thing that appeals to me so much about a capital is the, the symbolic nature behind it, because when it is designed, when it's constructed, when it's decorated, everything that goes into a capital building says something about the community that created it, whether it's a state capital or the United States. There are values, there are images, there are symbols that are imbued in this building that houses the democratically elected representative government. And so there's, there's just a fascination that I've had for a long time with capitals design, the construction, the battles that go into creating and using them over the decades, over the centuries. And Florida's capitals have gone through a much more dramatic and more recent change than a lot of uh, other state capitals have. And my interest specifically in the Florida capital started out when I was a graduate student at the University of Arkansas, and I had a, a research seminar where we had to pick a topic for a very general sort of post-World War II U.S. history, and you have to write some sort of primary source research paper on it. And the library at the university had an excellent, has an excellent uh, special collections with all sorts of different archival uh, materials. And one of the resources they have were the papers of an architect named Edward Durrell Stone, who was a prolific and popular architect in the middle of the 20th century. And so I was looking at Stone's paperwork, and he was involved with a couple of capital projects, but probably most prominently, and at the very end of his career and his life, was the construction of a new capital in Tallahassee. And so I wrote a, a paper for this class looking at that capital project as well as another one in uh, North Carolina and sort of flirted with a project in Hawaii that never came to be. And this paper that I wrote oh, a dozen years ago ultimately uh, developed into separate articles. I'm actually working on one for the North Carolina legislative building that Stone designed right now. But the Florida Capital Project, that emerged into its own separate article that appears in the Florida Historical Quarterly now. Okay. Yeah, well, that, that's a great background because that, that ties up a lot of loose ends that I think a lot of the readers probably will have or would have mm -hmm. had reading this. So and you gave great background to the article. Um, how was the creation of Disney World and the construction of a new Florida Capital Complex in the late 20th century related? The initial sense that you would get is that these are two very separate, distinct, unconnected projects. I mean, two very big construction projects, a state capital complex that's going to include the demolition of some of the old capital and construction of a huge new bureaucratic and governmental structure in Tallahassee. But then, you know, several hundred miles away, you have this 
theme park resort complex that is under construction that that seems like remarkably disparate proposals. But as I was going through my research uh, for this graduate school paper years ago, I was struck by the number of times letters between various people uh, working on the plans for the Capitol would reference this huge construction project going on in Orlando and the impact that it had, in part logistically. I mean, there there was such a great demand for uh, earth-moving machinery that clearing out the, the land for specifically the Magic Kingdom, the first part of Walt Disney World to open, that there were projects not only in Florida but throughout the Deep South that couldn't be done, major construction projects, because they couldn't find the machinery to do it. Uh, landscapers, you couldn't uh, uh, do major landscaping projects in Florida, including the Florida Capital Project. There were complaints from the landscape architect that the people from the Disney Corporation had hijacked every greenhouse, every shrub, every tree, every flower in the state of Florida, and they couldn't get the work that they needed to do in Tallahassee. And so these these regular appearances of the connections, so that the, the the unexpected intersections between the Florida Capital Project in the late 60s and through the 70s and Walt Disney World, they, they just kept ringing in the back of my mind. And so that's what inspired me to take the sort of nuts and bolts of the graduate school article and turn it into an article for the Florida Historical Quarterly that looked at how these two projects were often overlapping and intersecting. For example, in 1965, they're both essentially announced the the cat is out of the bag with the Disney project and how much land Walt Disney had been purchasing in Florida after rumors for several years of you know who's buying all this land and what's what's going to happen to it that that finally breaks in late 65 and also in 65 the state after years of planning and proposing and coming up with ideas for how to make state government more efficient and the home of state government more efficient they come up with the beginnings of plans that will lead to the new capital. Um, originally, the idea was to construct a separate legislative building, as had happened in North Carolina and a couple of other states in the 1960s, 1970s, that you'd keep the capital that you already had, but you'd basically move the legislature out of it to a huge new office building with separate chambers, and so the executive branch would keep the capital, and the legislative branch would have its own space. and during the the plans for this capital project idea, there was a new storyline that emerged, and I should say not a new storyline, one that's you know, simmered in Florida for decades, of where the capital should be. Is Tallahassee really the smartest place to have the seat of state government? And when Florida was founded in the you know, and joined the United States in the middle of the 1800s, there were basically two population centers. You had Pensacola and St. Augustine, and Tallahassee was picked because it was smack dab between the two of them, so it was seen as a, a, a compromise, a fair extension. From, you know, it, it was enough out of the way for both of them that they could consider it a, fa- a fair compromise. And there was really no non-native settlement south of that Pensacola-St. Augustine corridor farther down the peninsula. But as more people moved onto the peninsula in the 20th century toward Miami and Tampa and eventually Orlando, there was an increasing argument that the capital should probably move to a more central location as well. And Orlando was often discussed, even uh, going so far, and I mentioned this in the article, that there was some talk, maybe we could pair the projects of a new Florida capital and this huge new vacation plan that was being set up by Walt Disney, that maybe we could turn Orlando into this massive destination for tourism, for politics, and make, you know, remake Orlando as this incredible new community. And ultimately, Tallahassee kept the capital uh, through various political chicanery, plus the fact that a, a status quo is easier to understand than some major change. But just a, another good example of not only at, at the time 
that both projects are being discussed, but the fact that they so often overlap. The number of proposals and meetings that are held by members of the Walt Disney Corporation in the Florida Capitol as the fate of the building is being argued over, as the fate of the capital city is being argued over. So the building and the the Disney project keep running into each other over and over again. And I think that the biggest example of their overlapping is the the use of symbolic architecture in designing them. With the capital, there's sort of a, a traditional vision that a capital has to have a few things. It has to have columns. It has, Lord knows it has to have a dome. So as the proposals for a new capital are taking shape, there were people in state government who were fighting that, who wanted a more modern vision, showing that Florida in the 60s and 70s was an up-and-coming place. The population was growing rapidly. You wanted to demonstrate that through this symbolic building. And then you had other people in the argument who said, you know, we need to have a traditional building because this is what a capital is. This is what a capital looks like. Um, most, most famously, a state official, the state comptroller, a man named Fred Dickinson, who was nicknamed Dickinson the Dome Sayer by a St. Petersburg newspaper because his insistence was you have to have a dome. That's, that's the, the symbolism of this project. And ultimately, the, the design of a modern structure reflecting a modern, up-and-coming, cutting-edge state, uh, that, that eventually won out. But contrasting that battle in Tallahassee with what was going on at Disney World, when you look at the plans for Disney World, sort of the, the immediate mental picture you have is the castle and Main Street and, and the, the Magic Kingdom, the theme park part of it, which was the first part built. But the theme park was really secondary to what Walt Disney had envisioned. His plan for Walt Disney World focused specifically on Epcot, on what he called the experimental prototype community of tomorrow. And Epcot, as he envisioned it in the 1960s, was basically nothing like Epcot is today as a theme park. It it was intended to be a model city with industry, with high-tech transportation, a, a place to show off what American ingenuity could do and create a city that was clean and healthy and effective that could be a model for other communities around the, around the country. And so when, when you think about the vision of Walt Disney World, it's not castles and princesses that Walt Disney's thinking of. That's, that's sort of a means to an end, but his real focus is this sleek, modern, dynamic, efficient, effective community that's going to be a model for the rest of the country and it's going to show the rest of the world just how great the United States is. And so that design for Epcot that was the heart of the Walt Disney World project was, you know, reflects perfectly what is is being discussed in Tallahassee, that you want a capital that reflects this forward-thinking, uh, energetic, dynamic state of the future, not some sort of sleepy magnolias and Spanish moss, but you, you want to have this cutting-edge place. This is where we launch the rockets that go to the moon. This is where we do all of the things that show how cutting-edge Florida is, and it needs a capital to reflect that. Hmm. So, yeah, there, there are, I guess, many more uh, intersections there between the two projects than anyone would think on the surface, at least. And you, you've talked about a little bit about the kind of separating the two a bit. You've talked a bit about Disney World and the vision there. W- what else stood out to you about the construction of Disney World, either related to the, the connection with the capital or even just on its own? There's a great book that I reference in the, the article that looks at Disney as the architecture of reassurance, that one of the things that makes uh, Walt Disney World or Disney Parks in general appealing is – the attention to detail and so that the comforting feel that you get, even if it's you know some wild adventure or futuristic or fairy tale, it's you 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 feel as if you're in a comfortable, familiar, welcoming environment. And you know Walt Disney was a master of creating this this experience, whether it's a theme park or whether it's a film 
uh, that that inspired and, and funded the, the uh, theme park project at Disneyland, Disney World, wherever. There was this effort to create an atmosphere in a movie theater or at a theme park that made you feel comfortable, that made you feel welcome, and in as this book describes, is is a reassuring place. And I think that that's one of the core characteristics of the experience of a Disney theme park. There was uh, criticism when, when Walt Disney World opened that it didn't really portray anything of the Florida experience, that it was, that especially the Magic Kingdom, the first park to open in 71, was just a, a larger copy of what California had at, at Disneyland. And that whether it was Epcot as the theme park eventually opened or any other projects that showed up at Walt Disney World, that there wasn't anything specifically Florida about it. And there there was a great deal of criticism that you know, Walt, Walt Disney World doesn't say anything about Florida or the experience of Florida. And yet when you think, you know, so many people from around the country, when – those of us out in the giant rectangles in the West, when we think Florida, we think, you know, giant Mickey Mouse ears, and it, it's sort of that, that automatic thing. There's beaches there, too, but it's all it's Mickey, you know, that's that's what Florida is. And yet, as I point out in the article, it, it's not really the purpose of Walt Disney World to reflect Florida or to try to encapsulate the experience of the state of Florida, because frankly, that's the state capital's job. It's the capital's job to reflect the communities. I mean, Walt Disney World is a for-profit theme park that entertains people and hopes you know you leave enough of your money to allow them to keep the gates open tomorrow for the next people. So the design of the Walt Disney World project starts out with the Magic Kingdom and that model of Disneyland in California. As I mentioned, it's it's really Epcot that was Walt Disney's pride and joy. And this grand vision of a modern, futuristic, efficient city that, that he proposed never came to be in large part because you know he died about a year after the Florida project was announced. It was public in November of 65, and he died in December of 66. And whether Epcot was ever going to take shape in the way that he envisioned it, I mean, that's, that's a, a what if we can argue for the rest of time. But the vision that he had for Epcot was not necessarily that, that reassuring Disney feel that you get on, on Main Street or riding Dumbo or the teacups. The vision that Epcot had was one of celebrating American ingenuity, technology, American prosperity. It, it was It's very much a Cold War project. Uh, you know, Walt Disney was a Cold Warrior, as many corporate you know, individuals in the U.S. were in the 1950s and 60s, you wanted the U.S. to look stronger, more uh, impressive than the Soviet Union. And so if we can create a new model city to inspire the world in the heart of Florida, then, then that's exactly what we have to do for the United States and for our friends and allies around the world to make us look better than, than the competition in Moscow. And when even when you had the uh, the Epcot project built as a theme park, sort of reimagined after Disney's death, it it still went through this argument about what should the vision be. And one of the coincidences between Walt Disney World and the Florida Capitol was that while state officials were emphasizing that the Capitol needed to be this sleek, modern place, they weren't concerned about 19th century architectural traditions. Disney uh, Disney World and Epcot specifically essentially did the opposite because the centerpiece of the group of nations at Epcot, the World Showcase, was the American Pavilion. And the original designs for the American Pavilion were a sleek, shiny, stainless steel, uh, very futuristic-looking vision that that would have echoed in the tiniest frame the way Walt Disney had viewed his original Epcot plans. And ultimately that was dropped and they created this brick Georgian structure for the American experience that looks like it was photocopied from Colonial Williamsburg. <laughs> and so Walt Disney World did 
what the traditionalists in Tallahassee wanted and and were denied. Hmm. Okay. So so that explains a lot. It's the image the, the different ideas on the image of of Disney. They weren't necessarily supposed to reflect Florida, I guess, based on what you're saying. So turn it around then, or, or going back to the Capitol. So they're going to, to renovate the Capitol. They're going to construct it. What kind of stood out about the construction of the Capitol? Um, and and if, if anyone's been in Tallahassee and they've seen the Capitol, certain things stand out visually. I don't know how much you want to talk about that, but, but what kind of stood out about the, the construction of the Capitol or the renovation of the Capitol at this time? Well, I will do my best to maintain, you know, the family-friendly podcast. <laughs> there is that one thing everybody knows, and, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but, but you're, I mean, you're right to point it out. First and first and foremost, the capital that existed in the middle of the 1960s had stood in Tallahassee since the 1840s. It was 120 years old, and it had been expanded. In every direction, it had been expanded up and out, and was was an incredible, complicated architectural mess. Um, it was inefficient. It, it just did not work for state government anymore. And especially by the middle of the 20th century, as Florida's population is skyrocketing, which means that the challenges facing state government are expanding at a rapid pace, and the capital just was not able to, to, to deal with that problem. And so starting in 65, there are a series of proposals. First, the, the idea of a separate legislative building, and then we'll just keep the capital as it is and, and renovate it into an executive uh, office structure. And things changed pretty clearly at the end of the 1960s, early 1970s, during uh, the administration of Governor Ruben Askew. And Governor Askew was a, a fan of celebrating this idea of a modern, cutting-edge state. And he looked at the, the Florida State Capitol as this decayed, crumbling, chaotic old ruin that really didn't reflect what he envisioned in, uh, Florida was and could be in, in the decades to come. And so he worked, uh, Governor Askew worked with Edward Durrell Stone, who at this point had had a prolific career. By, by the time Stone gets into the project in the late 60s, He's an internationally renowned name. He designed the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., U.S. embassies in various places around the country, massive corporate headquarters and universities, He's just a prolific architect. And Stone was known for what was called the international style. And you've got modernism, which is you know sort of simple, clean, square, basic lines, nothing ornate, nothing fancy. And Stone and the international style took modernism, and they just gave it a, a, a little bit of a decorative tweak. They would put just a, a few little patterns or shapes or outlines uh, just to give it a little flavor of the uh, of, of sort of architectural showing off. Uh, the Kennedy Center is a, is a good example of that. It's a giant marble box, but it has these simple columns around it. I mean, they just look like little piers to hold up the edge of the roof, but they're basically a, a modern echo of the columns that are on every other neoclassical building in Washington, D.C. So trying to take the modern style but still have some echoes of, of tradition. Now, that's not to say that Stone was was necessarily a, a romantic at heart. He, he infamously took his beautiful brownstone home in New York City and put this giant concrete grill, you know, the, the cinder blocks that you'd buy for decoration in your garden at, at the home improvement store. He covered the front of the wall of his brownstone with these concrete blocks, which was one of his trademarks. But yeah, you know, not necessarily historic preservation as we might imagine it today. But what Stone offered was a popular architect who had designed efficient and effective structures around the planet, and he was he was well known. He was generally well liked. His his reputation today is 
not positive, although there's at least more interest in him. Uh, he's usually sort of dismissed as this boring old fart who did boring boxes in the middle of the 20th century. Basically, we look at Stone today the way people of the 1950s, Stone's time, looked at the Victorian era, this hideous, ridiculous, obnoxious, ostentatious nonsense that needed to be gotten rid of. So architecture goes in waves. You know, it's for a while it's passé, and then you, it becomes nostalgic. Then you say, "Oh, yeah, my grandparents, my great grandparents lived in something like that." But if if it's something more recent, like we, you know, we look at a building from the 1980s and we think, "Oh, my lord, what were they thinking? What a nightmare!" Give it 20 or 30 years, and people will be saying, "You know, there's there's some. It speaks to us in a way. It, it says something about about that time." Uh, as painful as that might be to think of brutalism as becoming something people are affectionate toward, <laughs> it, it'll happen. And with Florida, Stone goes through a couple of different schemes. Uh, initially, he essentially recreates the Kennedy Center with a glass bubble on the top. And the idea was to have legislative chambers on both sides of that glass bubble rotunda and uh, legislative office buildings farther out, and then a skyscraper that stood over the complex that would house the executive branch. And this project would be modified a number of times. Eventually, the executive tower was slid into the building, replacing that glass dome and the rotunda. So the legislative chambers are still there. The tower is still there. They've all just sort of been smushed together. But the stone was enough of a architectural romantic to know that if this is a capital, it needs to have a dome of some sort. It needs to have a rotunda. And so his initial plan was that glass-covered dome with a central space in a very modern building. And then it, it leads into a fight from about 1969 to 71 over whether there could be a modern building or whether there should be a more traditionally uh, designed, you know, simple columns and a, a dome that looked kind of like the U.S. Capitol dome. And ultimately, the Florida Capitol, as designed and as approved in late 71, early 72, was very much a, a modern project, but it was, it was a compromise. And it was constructed from 72 to 78, and the project was finished the new the project for the new building was finished in 78 with a big dedication ceremony one of the big arguments during the design was what should happen to the old capital because the new one was basically built around it from the south west and north it kind of curved around the old building to to the point where it was built only a couple inches away from where the old building stopped and stone from the very beginning wanted to restore the core of the building, the one that was built in the 1840s, basically strip away all of the old extensions, anything that had been added over the past 120, 130 years, just the original core, and leave that in the middle as a, as a museum space. And uh, Governor Askew did not like that. He wanted the entire old building leveled and to create this huge new plaza in front of the modern building as, as a gathering place, a place for inaugurations and you know, state ceremonies and things. And ultimately, there was a compromise that a lot of the additions were removed, but they didn't restore the building back to its original shape, in large part because the original building in the 1800s didn't have a dome. So they restored it back to 1902, where there were two small wings and a sort of squarish boxy dome that had been attached onto it. So they went back as far as they could to keep a capital with a dome that's now a, a, a museum of Florida politics. And when tourists visit the capital, they see that building and they automatically think that's the capital and they don't realize it's actually the modern structure that stands around behind it. Um, one of the things that I found sort of painfully funny when uh, when I was working on this project was that when Governor Askew died just a couple of years ago, like so many politicians, he laid in state in the state capitol as a, a final tribute. But his body was laid in state in the old capitol museum rather than the building that he actually liked. He hated the old building. He wanted it completely leveled. And so the fact that 
there was this one last indignity that his body was was not set in the rotunda of the new building that he liked, but in the old building that he wished didn't exist anymore. There's something a little rude and <laughs> worthy of a chuckle about that. But you you cannot avoid the elephant in the room of the fact that the Florida State Capitol looks a little scandalous, depending on uh, depending on your perspective, that it has this tall central tower flanked by the two legislative chambers, you know, the executive tower in the middle, and then there's a legislative chamber to the north and the south that each have their own little domes over them. And from from the very beginning, you know, from the, seven, the late 70s on when the building was dedicated, it became this joke that there is this phallic-shaped state capitol looming over Tallahassee, the tallest building in the capital city. And by all accounts, Nobody ever intended it to have that scandalous comparison. And so it, it does look a little controversial, but by all accounts, nobody ever intended it that way. It's just one of those accidental architectural things. You've really given a great overview of the topic and, and your analysis of it. Uh, what we always like to ask the authors of articles, in addition to the work they've done, we, we want to ask about legacies today. It seems like the construction of the Capitol or the renovation that you, you discussed and the construction of Disney, that they would have legacies on either architecture or planning something today, but maybe not. What, what, what do you think? Are there legacies of these two processes on Florida today? Well, I think there, there's very different legacies because of the intentions for Walt Disney World and for the, the Florida Capitals. We can use plural since you know the, the old one in the muse- as the museum and then the new functional one. First off, as as you go through the history of both of them, going back to the idea of coincidences, when the same year both projects are announced, the idea of a new capital project and Walt Disney World are announced in 65, and then in 71, the design as it stands today in Tallahassee was approved just a couple weeks after the Magic Kingdom opened in uh, Walt Disney World, the first part of that project, and the restored museum part of the old capital opened within a couple weeks of Epcot opening in 1982. So the the dates, they keep running into each other. In fact, that was a problem sometimes for state officials to make sure that they had their calendars right because uh, they, they needed to make sure they were at the dedication ceremonies for Walt Disney World this day, and then we've got the capital stuff coming up very soon. And so that they, they keep intersecting with each other. But the legacy, I think, is very different because the the Florida State Capitol is is not is certainly not the most architecturally popular capital in the Union. In fact, because so many people look at it and say, "Well, it's it's not a capital. It doesn't have you know neoclassical columns and a, a dome like the U.S. Capitol and, and the, the image that we've had basically since the end of the Civil War of of what state capitals are supposed to look like." and you know, when you, when you see the Capitol today, once you've stopped giggling at what it kind of looks like, there's sort of grudging acknowledgement of it. There, there's not a lot of people who adore the building or celebrate it. It's, it's just sort of there. It, it works. It's not, it's not likely to change in any great sense, in part because of the, the controversies that are involved in designing and constructing such a symbolically important structure that there's there's not a lot of flexibility once once the capital is complete unless there's some sort of trauma you know a, a fire or something the capital's basically set from from there on out as the decades go by as as i said there's this tendency for architecture to be passé and then it starts being, oh, I remember buildings that looked like that when I was a kid. And then there's new architecture that you contrast it to. And I don't, I don't know that the Florida Capitol will ever hold sort of a, a, an emotional place in the, the hearts of Floridians the way that some other capitals do, and frankly, some other capitals don't around the country. But I think there's a, there's a better chance that it will come to be embraced at least as you know that this this is our this speaks to us it spe- it spoke to us in the 70s reflecting what was going on in Florida at the time and it still reflects this this distinct community within the United States 
um, as I argue toward the end of, of my article in the quarterly, that the arguments that take place in a state capital are contentious. Uh, capitals are a place for controversy. And it kind of stands to reason that these contentious battles should have a contentious arena. You know, it should be a, you know, a place that's, that's fought over by itself as well as fought over within over the big issues of the day. And when you contrast the potential legacy uh, and, and utility of the Florida Capitol with Walt Disney World, the story is very different because Disney World – and Disneyland and Universal and, and theme parks around the country and around the world, they they aren't static in the way that a state capital is. They can't be. They, they are continually changing because you're trying to keep up with the market. You're trying to keep up with the demands of people looking to spend their money on vacation, trying to convince them to spend them here and not there. So Walt Disney World, like any of these these projects, goes through a continual renewal and reinvention. And architectural styles will come and go, new buildings come in, old buildings are redesigned. There's, there's a flexibility that has to be there in a market-driven uh, project like a theme park that doesn't exist, that can't exist in a civic project like a state capital. So there's really not necessarily any way to, to guarantee that Anything at Walt Disney World is permanent or you know, will always look that way, will always feel that way, it, it's going to have to move with the times. And the capital doesn't necessarily have to do that. The capital can, can be that legacy of what Floridians thought about themselves in the 70s, the arguments about how it should look in the 70s, how it should look today, and yet always reflecting that that this is the place, whether we enjoy the building, whether we appreciate the building, whether we dismiss it or laugh at it, this is the place where we come together. This is the place where we are elected from Key West and Sarasota and Jacksonville and Pensacola, and we all gather together in this building, and we decide what makes us Floridians. What, what are our goals? What are our needs? What are our interests? What do we have in common? So Walt Disney World might be a fun place to visit, but the influence, the role of the Capitol building is far more significant, far more important, because that's where the decisions of, of what does it mean to be a Floridian, that's, that's where those are hashed out. So whether the design of the building becomes you know, more appealing or just sort of accepted as the years go by. It's the purpose of the capital more than anything else. It's that role of drawing people from diverse backgrounds and cultures and economies and, and ideas. Everybody comes together in this controversially shaped building and tries to answer what does it mean to be a Floridian? What do we have in common? And, and how do we move forward together? That's the power that a capital has. You've given us a great overview and definitely made your case for the intersection of two projects. But Dr. Everett, I really appreciate you speaking with us today. I really appreciate you writing the uh, article for the uh, Florida Historical Quarterly. I think readers will get much out of it. I know I did. Thank you very much. That's wonderful, Dan. I appreciate it so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining our international audience for this podcast of the Florida Historical Quarterly. The Florida Historical Quarterly is the peer-reviewed scholarly journal of the Florida Historical Society. The society was founded in 1856 and is the only statewide historical organization in the state of Florida. The society is headquartered in Cocoa, Florida, and the editorial offices of the journal are in the Department of History at the University of Central Florida. I hope you have enjoyed the Florida Historical Quarterly podcast and that you will consider supporting future scholarship on Florida history by becoming a member of the Florida Historical Society. We also invite researchers to access back issues of the Florida Historical Quarterly on JSTOR. Thank you again for listening to the Florida Historical Quarterly podcast. If you enjoy listening to this interview and know of others who enjoy history, please tell them about the podcast and have them find us on Facebook. 